What's up, everybody? Scott with you again on The Record Player. Today is a special day with us on TRP because I am so happy to be joined uh, by a man who has created some of the, some of the best music uh, that this country has ever heard. Um, from the platinum selling album and multi award winning Northern Pikes, I'm joined by Mr. Jay Semko. Great to have you with you, Jay. Have you with us? Great to be here, Scott. <laughs> Great to be here, Scott. <laughs> uh, thank you so much um, for being with us. Uh, I know you guys are just coming off a couple of, um, you know, getting back into it with a couple of live shows uh, in the past few weeks. Um, first shows obviously in quite some time for you guys uh, you played in Saskatoon you played in Winnipeg you started things off in, in Saskatoon if I'm not mistaken was that on purpose did you want to kind of be home when you started things off you know it just kind of worked out that way I mean we had a we had an offer to play at the Saskatchewan Jazz Festival mm -hmm. which we've never played at before and uh thought, wow, well, this is great. Cause I mean, this is where we're from originally. Yeah. It, it was really quite interesting, the synchronicity, how that all worked out. But, you know, now the, the band, we're very spread out. I mean, Brian lives in Nova Scotia. Dawn lives in BC. I live in Saskatoon here. And Kevin, our newest guy is in Toronto. So, I mean, we're literally <laughs> east to west coast and a couple of people in between so but it worked out really well I mean you know Don's still got family here etc and uh and it's still kind of home we, we have lots of friends I mean you know the guys see people that they know etc so we rehearsed for a couple of days which was good because we haven't played last time we had played uh previous to the to August 15th was uh, November 2nd in Toronto we did two nights at the Horseshoe Tavern actually, mm -hmm. actually in Toronto in 2019 and uh, we obviously had you know had shows planned throughout the summer of 2020 which got cancelled etc so yeah no we got to rehearse and that was really fun actually just sort of you know take a look at a couple of different songs and a few things we hadn't really done for a while and it's really fun and reacquaint yourself as as a, a band it, you know we stayed in touch via you know, the internet and phone calls, et cetera, you know, we're all pals. So we stay in touch anyway, kind of thing. So a lot, but, of, zooming, a lot of zooming back and forth, huh? <laughs> a lot of zooming, a lot of zooming going on. And, and, you know, it was really fun. So I got to say, though, I mean, I was a little bit kind of semi nervous when we played. I think all the guys were, were just a little bit. That's the longest we've gone without playing a live show in many, many years. So, you know, there's that sort of yeah, but it's good. It's good to get a little bit nervous sometimes, you know, it sort of gets you going. So then when we went to Winnipeg the following week, we played last, uh, the the following week after the Jazz Festival, we played in Winnipeg. And that was really fun, too, because it was a bit of a different environment. And they, it was it was raining. So they moved all the shows inside and it was a multi band uh, event. So there was us in 5440 and the Jim Cuddy band and a, and a band from Winnipeg called the Treble. And uh, it was fun because, I mean, we've played lots of gigs with, you know, 5440 and the, all the people in the Jim Cuddy band through the years. And, and it was really good to see everybody. And I think they were happy to see us, too. You know, it was because one of those things where you kind of go, this is cool. And we're all we're all we're all around. We're all still playing music. And this is this is good. There was a sense of joy. There really was involved in, in that that particular show. You know, I mean, I felt it. And I felt it from everybody else. And I think there's just sort of that we're coming out of a a long and strange period of, of change and you know to sort of get back on the track and go wow we're playing music in front of people not you know there's precautions taken I mean you know the, the the precautions are actually stricter in Manitoba than in Saskatchewan which was okay with me actually I mean I'm an older person and I've even though I have been you know, double vaxxed and the whole thing I and so of all of us you, you still you're careful you know you just want to be you just want to be careful. I'm sure it was nice too to get out with with some friends, like you said, people that you, you, you know you've known for a long time. Not just you guys on a stage, but to be able to share that with with Jim Cuddy and the other guys as well was probably awesome. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, when you guys first started out, um, Northern Pikes, uh, a couple of independent records, um, uh, a lot of airplay on like college radio and independent radio and that kind of thing. You guys really found a niche with the college crowd at that back at that time, um, but it wasn't until this, which came out uh you guys got signed to virgin records this is like i mean this was the soundtrack to my you know youth and 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 uh and you know learning about music and all that stuff and i, I don't know how many times this album or this one or you know secrets of the album got played 
uh, on our turntable, but um, you got to record this album at Metalworks Studio. Uh, that's pretty heady stuff for a band coming, you know, making their first major label album, being able to do it at Metalworks and, and with, you know, the, the, you know, at the place and the people that you got to work with back then. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because we got signed, you know, we did our first two indie albums. We, you know, financed them ourselves and we just played and worked and got loans and did whatever we needed to do and kept on doing it to get it out. And that's really what attracted the interest, I think, of record labels. And I mean, the first time we actually played in Toronto in front of A&R artists and representative people from record labels was in the, uh, the fall of 1985. And uh, pretty much much everybody was there apparently at the our show we did two shows we opened up for first one we opened up for the jeffrey hatcher group at the horseshoe and then the next night we headlined at the holiday tavern which was just down the street that mm -hmm. became other i think it became the big bop and i don't know other names perhaps that i'm not even aware of but <laughs> yeah they were all there and uh and then we kept slugging away for the following year you know and playing and you know we're promoting our uh our independent albums and uh and we got the attracted the interest of doug chappelle from virgin records and he was you know he actually came to saskatchewan in the fall of 85 to see us play and uh, you know beyond that and fell in love with the band and and started following us closely and uh the really i guess they the the offer was made to sign the record deal with virgin in the september of 80 six and we signed it it took a few months of negotiation and it was a long and seemed long to us anyway i guess it's just sort of the industry standard but when you're 25 everything seems to take too long you know so yeah. anyway we uh <laughs> we signed the record deal at the copa the club the copa in toronto we played a gig that night we were floating around on cloud nine went home for christmas for about a week and then started right in the studio and uh, that started right after new year's in Toronto and we were in uh, Metalworks. We did our first few weeks in Metalworks, but we were kind of double booked with another band. So what ended up happening is we did the night shift, which was starting at eight at night and going till eight in the morning. <laughs> and it was okay, because we were fairly nocturnal anyway. And, you know, but Fraser Hill and Rick Hutt are our producers who worked on our first three records with Virgin with us. They, uh, it was tough, tough for them too. I mean, it was just like, after a while, it kind of, that kind of wears you down if you're not completely used to it. And so after a few weeks, we decided, okay, we need to break this up. We can't really continue on this schedule because we just felt like we weren't getting enough done. It was just, you were just really burnt out at five in the morning and trying to go in and record an acoustic guitar track or something, you know, it was like, so we ended up going to a bunch of different studios. I, I wish I could remember them all. I know there was sounds interchange. I know we went out to Hamilton to Grant Avenue Studios. We went to Tom Tremuth's studio in uh, Toronto, which was hypnotic. And um, I can't remember the other ones, but there were, I think, six studios altogether that we worked in. We ended up mixing at McClear Place, which was very famous at the time, anyway, for a lot of work that a lot of Rush albums had been recorded there. And it was cool there. I really liked it. That was a night shift there, too, at McClear, but it didn't seem so. It didn't seem so tough because we weren't tracking that much. We went in and did the odd overdub of things that, you know, we needed to fix when we were mixing, but uh, it was all, you know, it was mainly mixing there. And there was, it, it, it was great. I mean, you know, it, it's every record I've ever done, whether it be a Northern Pikes record or my solo records or other projects I've been involved in, the last part of making the album, the mixing, and if there's any fixes you need to do is always stay up for a few days and push it to get it done and it you know and that's what we you know we were very we are very much perfectionists in that way and so we we put the work in and it's like until the last <laughs> till the last thing is done we're we're there and we're involved in it kind of thing and as with most with most people who are really serious about what they do you know um the when i say recognizable i mean most recognizable songs off the top of my head, um, I have some written down here, but I mean, Inland, uh, Things I Do for Money, Girl with a Problem, Kiss Me, You Fool. That's just scratching the surface on, on what you guys did. It's an impressive body of work, um, you know, in, in your career. 
as a songwriter, do you feel, do you look back on that and, and realize how special that is? Or are you guys, or you as a songwriter, are you one of the people who kind of looks back and says, well, it's mine. So it's, you know, I don't appreciate it probably as much as I do these other things because it's mine. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting question. I sort of, I mean, I'm very proud of all the stuff that we've done. I, I really am. And I, I really feel like the stuff with the Northern Pikes, even though there might've been songs that I, you know, I, I wrote, the lion's share of, or Brian did, or Merle did, or even songs that all four of us wrote together, that Don and Merle and Brian and myself wrote together. I mean, it they became band songs. And, you know, later in our careers, we, we kind of, we separate, we, at the beginning we separated, it was like, okay, this is a song written by Jay, or this is a song written by Brian or by Merle or that kind of thing. And later on, we realized, you know, because we always were very democratic and very socialistic in our in our divisions of songwriting uh, royalties and publishing royalties and that kind of thing. So we uh, we changed it over to make it so that everything was a four way co-write because they really were. And, you know, when I look at any song that we've done, you know, and I can look at a song like Shane Pretty, which became a really, a really big single and was very successful for us. And really, that is Brian. That's Brian's story and and he came up with the, the the lion's share of that song but still everybody contributed something to it that made it it's gave it a final sound and gave it its its character and it's the same with things i do for money yes i wrote things i do for money on an acoustic guitar but without that kind of cool guitar tapping thing that brian did and without the the you know 16th hats that donnie did and you know i can look at every one of our songs and find that you know i can look at kiss me you fool with merle and you know, without him suggesting that I do a harmony at a certain part in the verse, it wouldn't be the same, you know? So, so the Northern Pike songs are definitely, they're band songs. And I feel, I feel like there's, everybody contributed in a big way. And that continues up to the most recent album, Forest of Love, which included Kevin King, which is our, our, our fourth, he's our fourth guy now. And uh, once again, very democratic about it. And I, I would say democratic slash socialistic because you need to do that to be a, a band and we, we learned some lessons actually from our management from Fraser Hill and Ed Smeal in our in our early days of, of them working with us they, they gave us examples of of other bands where there was kind of one primary songwriter who ended up you know they ended up getting some airplay and getting some success etc and this person ended up you know doing well financially and philosophically and the, rest of the other members tended to feel like, what am I doing here? And, and they didn't last. The dissension gets created and dissension gets created in every band anyway, it always. <laughs> it's just life, you know, it's like, so, so if you can try and avoid that by, by being as fair as possible, I think that's a really positive thing. And we learned that early and I think that was a, a good thing for us. You mentioned She Ain't Pretty, you guys, uh... Uh, were just recently, well, not recently, not this week or anything, but awarded the SOCAN Award for uh, for that song for a certain amount of was a hundred thousand radio plays or something. Um, yeah, hundred thousand radio plays. Yeah, in Canada, yeah. I mean, that's 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 a lot. <laughs> and that song it's was a huge hit for you guys. I mean, how are you guys with awards? I mean, do you do you like the accolades? Do you do you feel comfortable with that? I would say. Yes, we've been nominated for lots of things and haven't won very many. So, <laughs> so when you actually win something, it's kind of cool, you know. And the SOCAN one, that's not a nomination. That's just physical, just, yeah, physical just, yeah, absolutely, yeah. things, you know, the number of times you've been played on the radio and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I think awards are cool. I would still love it if the Northern Pikes could win a Juno Award, you know. Who knows? We're, we'll, we're still around. We're still trying. So to um, me, that was always a, a big thing, you know. I'll be honest with you. When I was looking up and doing a little bit of research knowing that you and I were going to talk. I, I was surprised to see that you hadn't. I was shocked to see that you hadn't won a Juno Award. You've been nominated, I think, eight times. I was amazed that you hadn't won one. Yeah, we've been nominated, but I mean, we did one, you know, what did we win? We won the Prairie Music Award, which became the Western Canadian Music Awards a couple of years later. And that was uh, for our album, Truest Inspiration, which was kind of neat because it was really not necessarily a commercially successful record although I think it was a good record I think it's really it's interesting I mean I, that's one of my faves in many ways you know there's a bit of a there's a little bit of a dark quality to it but I think that's neat I think it's cool when bands expand you know and Absolutely. I think our our albums I honestly think that our, our albums have 
improved as time has gone on. And I think we're, I think we're maybe better musicians than we, than we were just, it's just by time and through osmosis and through playing and through recording and doing all that stuff. I think, you know, I mean, Brian for instance, if you, yes, he's definitely, he's right now almost finished his degree uh, from Berkeley School of Music. And I mean, he's, he's close to finishing that and he's been working on that for the last number of years. And, and it's interesting to see all of a sudden he's like, Hey, hey he plays all these jazz chords and stuff. And you're going, Hey man, that's kind of cool. You know? So everybody, you know, everybody has continued to do, to do music. You know, I mean, Merle, Merle stopped playing with us in 2005 and, and, you know, Sometimes I, I, I mean, he's my, he, you know, he's one of our best friends. I mean, you know, and we still stay in touch regularly, he's still a buddy and always will be, you know, but, he, you know, people, life changes and time goes by and, and he, he was just not really, the last couple of years he played with us, I don't think he, I think he was doing that more because he's had a sense of obligation about playing with us and didn't want to let us down as his friends. And then uh, it just became one of those things where he just wasn't really into it and Okay, well that's cool. So be it. So people I mean, we've played in a few different configurations since then. We played as a trio for a while. We played with Ross Nikifora, who was our our kind of our fifth guy for the Snow and June and Neptune tours. He played keyboards with us on stage, and and then we went back to playing as a trio. And then when it came time to do uh, the new record, Forest of Love, we were starting to think. Well, actually, but pre, pre previous to that, because it was a 30th anniversary tour of Big Blue Sky. And we wanted to have a fourth person up there with us because that's what the record was. It was Big Blue Sky was four people with three vocalists. And Brian had been out uh, performing with and recording with Kevin Kane. And they put out a record as Kane Pop Fan. And it just, uh, and I, I was, I just said, well, you know, you've been playing with Kevin. It sounds really natural what you guys do. Let's see what it's like. So he came out for a couple of test shows with us in 2016. We played the Seneca Queen Theater in Niagara Falls, and then we played a Canada Day thing in Brantford, Ontario, with a bunch of bunch of other bands. Were our peer group, which was really fun, actually, and uh, and it was just like fit like a glove. It just worked really well and seemed very natural. And so he's kind of played with us ever since, literally, you know, and became a fourth member of the group. And so when in, when it came into do Forest of Love, that was. That was an injection of freshness too, having a new a new guy in the band. Um, uh, Kevin obviously comes from uh, Grapes of Wrath, uh, so you guys you mentioned peer group. I mean that's kind of the group of, of bands that you guys kind of grew up with was you Grapes of Wrath, uh, Fifty Four Forty, Chalk Circle, Spirit of the World. So many great Canadian bands from that time. Um, the when Merle left the band and, and he came, Kevin was kind of a hired gun when he came in, but he wound up sticking. What energy has he brought to to, I mean, he's a songwriter as well, so he wants to get his his piece in there as well, I'm sure. But what what different energy has he brought to the band? Um, maybe a little different than Merle. Well, Kevin is he's a really good musician. He can really play the guitar. I mean, Merle could play too. It's it's I, I can't really compare them. It's kind of apples and oranges to a certain extent, you know. It really is. But uh, but there are similarities. Kevin sings in a higher register. He's a good songwriter and he writes somewhat quirky pop songs as Merle did as well. And, you know, you can sort of see those, those elements happening in there, just having a fourth mind in there. And he's really smart and he's done a lot of records and I'm a big fan. We're all big fans of Grapes of Wrath. I mean, I, I remember buying her indie album, I think September Bowl of Green on the advice of my friend, Ron Spaziri, who had the cool record store in town records on wheels and, and, uh, and they were a great band. It's interesting, we, we really didn't play that many shows with the Grapes of Wrath through the years. There's a few multi-band bills. We were on the same bill and that kind of thing. But, uh, but I always really loved the band and I loved their harmonies. And, and we ended up playing a bunch of shows together with them in the early 2000s and got to become friends with Tom and Chris and Kevin. And, and it just really fit well, the two bands, the, you know, the shows together. We had a lot of the same audience and that kind of thing. And I. I just really love their music. And so there's a, an element of respect in regards to musical talent and songwriting, you know, and uh, yeah, and Kevin's a cool guy. It just, it works really well. We've all, you know, it, it all just fits. And you, you have to, you have to be able to work together as 
you know, compadres as well as <laughs> as well as just people who work together and do music. And uh, he's got a great work ethic, and he gets things done, and he's he's super pro. And it's really fun. It's fun to play with him, you know. And the Northern Pikes have always been a four piece band, so that that added that that missing part of the puzzle that we kind of were without for a number of years, you know. When I uh, I actually interviewed Tom Hooper not that long ago, and when I when I spoke to him, he was uh, had nothing but nice things to say about you guys and about that time as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it to me the my favorite album of you guys is the one that I can't show because for some reason I can't find it on vinyl. It's driving me crazy. Uh, Snow and June was my favorite record of you guys from you guys. Um, the I love the song Greenfields, and, and I bring that song up specifically because it is my favorite Northern Pugs song. Um, I've never heard you guys do it live. I know you have done it in your, in your past shows, but anytime that I've seen you guys twice and both times you, you didn't do that song. Um, where did that song kind of come from? I mean, is that, it's special for me and it just feels like it would be special for you. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, I've had, uh, I've had relatives and as a little kid, I remember there was a, a picture and a medal on the in my grandfather's uh, mantle of his nephew who had been killed in World War II. And, you know, we had a number of veterans in World War II in our family. And uh, we were in the midst of recording. Actually, we were working on Big Blue Sky. And it was in the latter part of Big Blue Sky. We were doing our mixing and it was a nocturnal existence. So it would have been like March of... 87 really when I came up with the seed of that song and uh we were we were staying in rental apartments or were furnished apartments in Toronto and and I was rooming with Merle and we were I think on the sixth floor of a place and it was down sort of near uh Avenue Road and St. Clair area there and right across was another apartment building and I would see this elderly gentleman across there so you know my observations were of him you know, living his life there because I would, we would wake up at like four in the afternoon in the, you know, and at that time of the year, it's still kind of a bit hazy, you know, you, you sort of get in this weird kind of zone of is this night or is this, is this morning or evening or what, you know, when you're working at night like that. So I would see him and just observe this. And then the one day I saw him go downstairs and he, he had, uh, and it must have been a veterans uh, event or some sort of some sort and he had uh, you know the beret and he had the medals and he had his suit on and was going somewhere and it just sort of triggered a bunch of different thoughts and I just wrote it all down and and there it is and and then I refined it I guess over the course of the next couple of years and then it came time to do the record we did a, a demo of that in Saskatoon a demo recording at a place called Audio Art Recording and and we really liked the way that it sounded. So when when it came to do Snow in June, and that song was one of the one of the the finalists, I guess, because we always recorded more songs than we actually were intending to put on the on the records. It became kind of a finalist, I guess, and uh, and we rec we took the previous recording that we had because we really really liked the vibe of some of the things that were going on in that. And then we put it down, and then kind of overdubbed on top of it. So it was kind of half recorded in Saskatoon and half recorded at uh, Bearsville Studios in Woodstock, or just outside of Woodstock, New York, which is where we did Snow in June. And uh, yeah, it just became one of those ones that just kind of, and it's funny because we had, when we were mixing the album, the first, we had five songs mixed in uh, December. That was a long record. We started, really, we got to Woodstock in late August of 1989. And we rehearsed in the rehearsal barn, which is a sort of a, an area, you know, not quite attached to the studio, but just down the road from it. And, and we, the band was feeling pretty good. We actually went in to start recording, I guess, in a few weeks later, that would have been sort of late September and started working. And we were, we worked until, I guess, sort of just before Christmas and, and then just at that time we had five songs ready to roll and Hugh Padgham was going to be mixing five of the songs and that, that was the time he was available so it ended up that Fraser and Rick and Brian and myself flew to Los Angeles and we spent five days with Hugh with Hugh Padgham mixing at A&M studios there and then we took a little break for a few days just around Christmas we came back even before the new year 
and continued working uh, at Bearsville. And then it ended up having five songs mixed by Bob Clear Mountain. And Bob spent a lot of time actually up at, up at Bearsville Studios because he had a, a house up there and he, and it was nice. It was, it was you know, I, I think he spent a lot of time in New York City, which was not that far away, like a couple hours drive away from where we were in upstate New York, but beautiful area out there. I mean, you're up in the woods and it's really very serene and kind of quiet. So he ended up mixing five more songs from Snow and June. So we had three and those were quick mixes because they were right at the end. And basically we got to a point where we needed to be finished and it was February by then. And, you know, we'd spent a long time on this record. I mean, we started, I remember being just wearing nothing but like gym shorts when I first got to Bearsville. It was so hot and humid, which progressed into fall, which progressed into winter. And then by the middle of February, you felt like spring was on the way, you know, and uh, and then we had to finish and we were done. So Rick and Fraser mixed mixed green fields along with uh, three or four other ones that were done at that time. So that, that were the, the 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 ones that hadn't been mixed by by Bob or by Hugh. So I, I've, I just I've always loved that song and hearing you kind of explain where it comes from. It's, it's special for me because now when I listen to it, I'm going to hear it. I'm going to see all that in my head as well. Um, you guys have uh, uh, collaborations and things like that that you've done over the years. You worked with on Neptune, you worked with Marco Timmons, who's got one of the most beautiful voices in the world. And that song was incredible. Uh, Worlds Away was that song, or two songs actually, I think you did with her um, on that album. Um, you've done nine or 10 solo records. You've uh, 10 solo albums, I think, 10, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one of the things that you did, you've done a lot of television and, and, uh, and film work. You, you've, you did the, the theme and I think most of the music going forward uh, for the Deuce, for Due South. Uh, any Canadian has, I'm sure, heard the theme song of that show. Uh, and you became friends with Paul Gross, I'm assuming, because you also worked with him on the Men with, Men with Brooms, which, again, I'm not just saying all this, it's not co it's coincidental, but Men with Brooms is my favorite movie ever made. <laughs> love that. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love that movie. Um, was supposed to go see another movie. It was sold out thought oh, men with brooms what's that and i've seen it about a million times since uh but yeah what was what's collaboration like for you guys i mean do you have like a bucket list of people that you'd like to work with or or you know did those did those opportunities just kind of come up i mean a lot of it's been a little bit forest gumpish <laughs> you know right place right time coincidences at the same time, i mean when i look at our collaborations with the northern pikes i mean we, we've specifically had Sometimes people suggested to us and people that we pursued that we wanted to have, you know, guest with us. I mean, on Snow in June, we had, uh, uh, let's see, we had John Sebastian and we, you know, who lived in Woodstock, Garth Hudson, who lived in Woodstock, um, you know, Crystal Taliaferro, Stan Celeste, just just great musicians, just so, such a, another league of, of musicianship and, and just the experience and the little stories and glimpses that you hear from <laughs> from these folks. And I mean, and like you say, Margot Timmons, just I remember having goosebumps hearing her warming up in the studio with Rob Jasko, the you know, who produced uh, Neptune. And with with Do South, I mean that that happened. That was a great, in many ways a great coincidence. I just I ended up writing this theme song and and Brian contributed to it and added a big part. Like he ended up, you know, I contributed to him as a co-writer for that song. And uh, so really that thing was ultimately, I guess, would say it was written by, by Brian and myself. And, uh, and then when it came to, you know, I submitted that, the producers, you know, Paul Haggis, who is kind of the creator of the show, really liked the theme song. And, and he was suggested, like, would you like to try and work on the, on the music score? So they sent out, you know, some VHS tapes with some scenes. And I, I just wrote what I felt that seemed, you know, appropriate for what was going on. And they really liked that. And, so they brought me out to Toronto and hooked me up with two great film composers, Jack Lenz and John McCarthy. And these guys are like as good as it gets, in my opinion, like really, really talented people. And I was just really fortunate to work with them. And I had to, it was nerve wracking. I mean, you know, it was a big learning curve for me, you know, but, it, but I, I guess what I brought to the table is a bit of a, a more of a raw perspective on things. And I, I, I looked at the score as a very acoustic guitar oriented thing. And, 
So that, that was a cool thing. And, it, and that came along at a great time because I, I guess I was kind of craving collaboration because that happened when the band broke up really yeah. in 1993. We all went our separate ways and the opportunity came up for Due South. And really we kind of became our own little band, Jack and John and myself, you know, so we worked for a couple of years on that. And then there was a, a break for a year. And in the meantime, John moved down to Los Angeles and then the show got resurrected. Uh, and Jack and I worked on the last 26 shows together as a duo and so it went into syndication and I mean really you know and during the course of that I ended up working with Paul Gross because he uh and Jack had suggested those things too because he he said look why don't you and Paul work on this we need songs and Paul's you know he's a really good songwriter he and David Keeley a lot are, of people uh, don't realize that Paul's not just an actor he's a he's a good songwriter oh, and yeah, singer and yeah, really, you know David and Paul as a duo are great and I mean they've traveled a lot of people don't know I mean they did a tour in like South Africa and you know, they've been around around <laughs> as recording artists as well, which is, you know, they've recorded in some pretty cool spots and worked with some cool people. And so, yeah, I ended up co-writing some stuff with Paul. And then when it came to Men With Brooms, uh, really what happened was I ended up co-writing this song called Kiss You Till You Weep with Paul Gross. And uh, which you can hear, it's sort of towards the very, it's kind of the last song that kind of shows up in, in the movie. And they ended up incorporating part of that music, I guess uh, the, the themes of that song into the Men With Brooms theme. Yeah. So, you know, you can see there's a number of people that are co-contributors on the Men With Brooms theme. And that, that's because it really is a, a, an amalgamation of a bunch of pieces of music that kind of all got uh, sewn together to create that, that theme. And uh, it was fun, I mean, you know, uh, I've, I've written some fun things along the way that, that Paul's been involved with. We ended up writing a, a, a good portion of a Christmas song called Santa Drives a Pickup that was sort of based on a song that was sort of, you know, kind of alluded to in, uh, in an episode of Due South. And uh, yeah, and I ended up kind of, I remember it was like so hot. It was like 40 degrees and, and Jack Lenz had said, look, we've got, you know, you want to do some work on this, you know, do you, can you kind of finish this off and take it? And I sort of ended up doing a, a little demo and the studio was, in, it was so hot. It was in my friend Ross Nikifor's house because he was moving at the time and he recorded it there and then uh, sent it back out. It's so funny. You work on Christmas songs and it's like, well, that's why I was going <laughs> to Christmas song. When it's really hot outside, <laughs> you know, so, but yeah, no, you know, that's been just a joy for me. I've been so blessed to be able to, to have the opportunity to get to work with some just amazing people along the way. And you learn something from everybody that you work with, you really do. And uh, I, like I say, I just feel like I have won the lottery in the musical lottery in life with that in many ways, just because I've had the chance to, to work with a lot of these guys and, and girls that are just amazing, amazing musicians and, and amazing artists, you know? Um, I, I, I'll let you go. Um, I wanna ask first off before, we, before I let you go, um, a year off, two years off almost, uh, kind of confined to the house, no performing. Um, how much stuff do you have in the tank ready to go? Are we going to get a new Pikes album? Is it a Jay Semko record coming? Are you just going to concentrate on you guys getting back out on the road and performing? Well, one thing we're doing, which is kind of cool, we started an album in 2019, the Northern Pikes, that was, I guess, intended to be kind of a, a tribute to the Snow in June album for the 30th anniversary, which was in last year 2020 and because it got kind of shoved to the side we didn't really finish it so but it's close we're close to being finished and we're going out and we're playing in Newfoundland in early September we're doing a thing I think it's called the Iceberg Festival and we do a show with April Wine and Honeymoon Suite and then right after that we're going back to Nova Scotia which is where we were where we were working on this record what it is it's somewhat of a I would call it of a, a rootsy acoustic acousticized versions of some of the songs not all of the songs but some of the songs from snow and june and uh kind of a tribute to snow and june so that that will be released possibly later this year if not probably early next year and uh yeah so we're going out to to finish this so we're spending a few days in the studio with john adams who's the uh the person we worked on back in 2019 when we when we started the album so that will be finished uh solo stuff i've got 
I have a, a couple of ideas in mind that I'm, I'm working on here. I'm actually in the planning stages of doing a record of spiritual music. And I, and I, I leave that as a very wide <laughs> swath, you know, in terms of what that is. But uh, yeah, I've been, I've, I've written a lot of songs over the COVID. I did a lot of co-writing with a lot of friends along the way. And that was really quite fun. It kept me sharp. And in some of those days when it was sort of like, when you really start to feel like what's going on here, it kind of keeps your focus going and goes, you know, it keeps you thinking, okay, this is what I do. I, I can write, I write songs and eventually we're going to be recording these songs and we're going to be releasing them and we're going to be out playing music again here. So, you know, that kind of kept the, that focus going on. So yeah, yeah, it's a busy time for me. I've been in this recording studio yesterday and today working on a couple of different uh, projects that aren't necessarily well one of the songs might end up on a solo record there are songs <laughs> one's a kind of a historical song that's all I'll say about it I've been kind of semi commissioned to do this historical song and the other one was another song that's a bit basically a memorial song and so I've been keeping very busy I could be keeping keeping busy and I'm starting to play uh, some solo acoustic things as well as you know the pikes things that are going on and uh there's another band that i'm that i play with a bunch of buddies here and we get together and play cover songs and so i keep really i keep busy there's no shortage of things to do and i, and I absolutely love it like like i say i'm so i feel so lucky to be able to do this well yeah. with everything opening up you're gonna have hopefully a lot uh, well i mean i say hopefully opening up but uh, you're gonna you're gonna have uh, hopefully a lot of avenues and a lot of uh, hunger to get for people to hear live music so we can't wait i can't wait to get you back uh, through ontario i would love to see you guys again um it's a, it's a great great show thank you so much for being with us on the record player i have enjoyed this so much uh, a big fan of your music and you yourself so thank you again jay uh, i appreciate it hope you stay safe and uh, get out there and have some fun <laughs> thanks a lot scott really appreciate it it's Thanks, been great Dave. talking. Thanks. You too. Take care. Take care.